here by 10 to 10. So this is going to be a great day. Uh, Jesus is my Lord. Oh, Children's Church. I thought you would do that, Val. That was good. Jesus is my Lord, and I want him to be your Lord. And I want him to be, not that he isn't, and I want him to be everybody's Lord, because he's Lord. There is nobody like him. He is alone at the top of the heap, and he answers to no one except the Father, but everybody answers to him and i hope that you're considering making a commitment to christ as lord jesus said come to me believe in me which means to commit to him put your trust in him your confidence so we're going to sing a song at the end of the sermon and it's an opportunity for you if you've never done so to come and commit your life to christ you'll see king he's been working on the baptistry here this week getting it cleaned out and uh, Bob put a new heater in it, and we're geared to go. So uh, if baptism is a need that you have, everybody has at some point, um, if baptism by immersion into Christ is a need that you have, then we're ready. And uh, maybe you've already done that, and you just want to make this your church home. That's okay, too. It would be great. Or maybe you have prayer needs. We'd be glad to pray for you and lift you up before the Lord. Okay, we're going on the journey through the New Testament, and we're talking about the man. January, February, March, and April, we're focusing on the man, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And today, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, one of my favorite encounters is in the book of Mark, chapter 10. Would you stand with me as I read that? Mark 10, 17 through 22. Jesus, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. That was not a disclaimer. That was a affirmation that he was the right guy to talk to. Jesus said, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Right. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Lord, would you anoint the message and the messenger today? Would you help each one of us anoint us as listeners and hearers to see ourselves and to respond in kind. Father, have your way among us, and I thank you, Lord, for this great encounter and how Jesus dealt with this young man. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I've always liked this story. You may be seated, sorry. Uh, I've always liked this story. It's, I don't know, it's one of my favorites, and I've preached it on more than one occasion. I think because I see myself in it, and I see other people in it uh, as well. Now, as we go through this encounter that Jesus had with this young man, i got to warn you ahead of time. It may cause us to unthink some things that we had previously thought or been raised with. It may cause us to change our mind at a particular point place or juncture at some point along the line. And that's hard to do because we get used to accustomed accustomed to you and used to thinking and behaving and believing in a certain manner and a certain pattern. 
And so I just want to encourage you to be open. And, and, and it challenges me, too, a little bit as a presenter. I presented this before. I was watching, a, I don't know, I was looking for something on YouTube the other day, and something popped up about uh, the country singer George Jones and the song, He Stopped Loving Her Today. I don't remember the title. I thought, well, that looks pretty interesting. It was like a couple minutes long, and I clicked on it. And, and the guy who uh, produced the song was telling the story. And that was a big hit for George Jones, you remember, several years ago. He sang that song. And uh, I won't sing it for you. But, uh, so, <laughs> but when they come time to, because of his personal issues, it took him almost a year to finally get it recorded from start to start. And part of the problem that he had was when he came into the studio, he was singing a different melody to the song than the one that the song had. And the, they said, that's not the right melody. Yeah, but it's a better melody. He said, yeah, but Chris Christopherson already wrote that song. I don't think he would appreciate it using his melody for another song. And so as I get ready to prepare this sermon, I found myself kind of being in that same rut, that I've presented this before, but I thought, you know, I want to step back because as I was getting ready to prepare, I was like, I'll have to do this and that. And I said, nah, I presented it that way before. So I decided I want, to, I want to present it in a slightly different way and let it speak afresh. And it's the same content, but presented in a little different package and a little different way. So one of the reasons that I find this story so compelling is because when we look at this rich young man, this, this guy, he's, he's every man. The rich young ruler He's every man. He represents mankind at its best. He was rich. He was young. He was intelligent. He was moral. He had authority and clout. He would be on Men's Journal or, or on uh, People Magazine or on Wall Street Journal. I mean, he was, you know, he was, a, he was a star, for lack of a better term. He represents the best of what mankind could possibly be. And he's, but yet he's hungry. He wants to be right with God. And he runs up to Jesus, he falls on his knees, and he said, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? This is the number one question. This is the most important question in the world. There's no question that even comes close in comparison to the significance and effect of that one question. What must I do to have eternal life? Everything else is second to that, and it's not even a close second. He realized deep inside his own personal inadequacy before God. He knew that something was lacking or he would not have come up to Jesus in such a way. And that's why I say he's every man. Because there's a God-sized hole in every person's heart. Despite the veneer that we might put on or the pretense that we might give, there's a God-sized hole in the heart of every person. And that gnaws at us and desires to be fulfilled in some way now when you look at this guy he's just like you and me in many ways but he's just like you and me in this he wants to live he wants to live he runs up to g he runs up to jesus he didn't say jesus will you come over here i'd like to have a word with you but he runs up to jesus and he gets down on his knees and he's, this is in public. This is not at nighttime at, in a secrecy like Nicodemus came to him. This is, a, this is a member of the Jewish aristocracy. We don't even know his name. But he's a member of the Jewish aristocracy who comes up to Jesus in the middle of the day in front of all these people, gets down on his knees and asks the good teacher this question, what must I do to have eternal life? That's, i got to give the guy credit. This is a humbling experience for him. And why would he be so humble? I mean, he was young. He had probably uh, rich blood. He had wealth. He had authority. He had clout. 
Why was he so humble that he would risk all this in the middle of the day to ask, why would he do that? Because he wanted an answer to this question. Because he wanted to live. He wanted answers. He wanted the answer. There's a deep, abiding desire within him that he wanted to live. He wanted the best life, and he wanted the best life now, and he wanted the best life forever. And that's where I say we're like that. We want to live. Does anybody here doesn't want to live? Everybody wants to live unless you're, you know, cuckoo, cuckoo. Okay, everybody, that's an innate desire that we all have. Why do we have ENTs? Why do we have doctors? Why do we have hospitals? Why do we have firemen? Well, we just kind of assume it. It's because everybody wants to live. Everybody wants to live. And so that's, so I, again, I got to give him credit because he did, he did what other people weren't willing to do. He did what maybe some of you have not been willing to do. He came to Jesus and he asked him the question, what must I do to have eternal life? And note, he came to Jesus. He didn't come to Caiaphas. He didn't come to Nero. He didn't come to the Sanhedrin. He didn't come to Nicodemus. He came to Jesus. And friends, that's where I hope that you and I are like him, that we come to Jesus. Hear me. There's nobody else that has the answer to the deepest question that every person has. Only Jesus can give the answer to that. So I've been to church before, I know that. But do you believe it? Who else has the answer? Bill Gates, Buffett, is it Jimmy or Warren? Fauci, the Pope? Only Jesus can give the answer to that question. Only Jesus can give eternal life. I tell my small group, I says, witnessing to somebody or talking to them because we Christians get so befuddled about what we're supposed to say and we're afraid we don't have all the answers or we're not going to say the right thing and we're going to we're going to mess up and we're going to look like a fool and somebody's going to walk away and here's the, here's the thing that we can always remember and this is this is doable you can do this point people to Jesus point people to Jesus make him the issue ask them what do you think about Jesus have you read the New Testament? Have you read Matthew, Mark? Make Jesus the issue. Let them have an encounter with Christ, at least in their mind. Bring him to the surface. You don't have to answer the question about the history of Christianity, or what about this, or what about the pig. Just ask them, what do you think about Jesus? He is the focal point. This whole story underscores our inadequacy before God, does it not? Because this guy, Romans 3.23, is kind of echoed here. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so he asks Jesus the question, and Jesus answers the question. Jesus asked him about the commandments. You know the commandments. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Oh, he goes, yes, I know the commandments. He said, I've kept them from the time that I was a child. Really? And by the way, if he had, what's that say about you and me? Because I haven't. You see, the commandments, and this is why Jesus did this, because Jesus always took them back to the law. He always took them back to the commandments. Because the commandments break down our sense of moral superiority. The commandments call attention to the fact that we are not saved. The commandments call attention to the fact that we are not moral, righteous beings. The commandments point out the areas of our life where we have messed up before God and that's their purpose and so he says I've kept all these since I was a child 
And the funny thing, this, this, this catches me. The, the, the Bible says here that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Loved him. And he said, well, you lack one thing. He goes, all right, we're getting down to business here. I thought there might be something. Jesus said, go home, sell all that you have, give to the poor, give up treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. You know what Jesus did? He loved him enough to tell him the truth. He loved him enough to tell him the truth. He said, you've got some good things going for you, but you're not there yet. Now, friends, this is gut check time for you and me. If you love people, if you love people, you will tell them the truth about salvation. You will, at some point, help them to understand. In fact, you will not be able to not help them because it just eats at you until you get a chance to say it or do it. But help them to understand that, friend, you need Jesus. If you love people. When Joe Garman and Bill Scoble came into my dining, our family room, and Joe Garman, I'd never met him before I heard him preach, but they came into our family room, and when he confronted me as a 16-year-old, 16 and a half, you counted those things back then, and when he, when he questioned me about my eternity and confronted me in a loving way about my need for Christ in order to go to heaven, that was a gutsy thing for him to do. But the reason he did it was because he loved me. He didn't even know me, but he loved me enough to tell me the truth about my need for Christ. So I was on a visit with a friend. We were visiting some folks. And we left, and we had shared the gospel with them and asked the, the tough question and, and began to share the gospel a little bit. <clears throat> and as we left that day, I said to my partner as we were driving away in the car, I said, this is a strange line of work. He said, what do you mean? I said, I go into a person's home at their invitation. I tell them basically that they're going to hell. They feed us, thank us, and ask us to come back again. This is a strange line of work. But the reason people do that is because they want the truth. They'd rather you tell them the truth, as brutal as it is, in a kind way, than soft coat it and tell them a lie and lead them into false security. Because they want the truth. So, so far, so good with this guy. And then in verse 22, something went wrong. Verse 22. That's a wrong verse 22. I need Mark 10, 22. I'm going to pull it up. Um, so in Mark 20, in 10, 22, it says, Jesus told him what he needed to do, and it says, At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. His face fell. One scripture says his countenance fell. His, his face fell, and he went away sad. Because he had great wealth. As far as biblical information is concerned, it's the only one individual that Jesus issued a personal invitation to, a personal invitation to, who decided to walk away at one point. He might have been the first, but he wasn't the last. So what was his problem? 
What was his problem? Generally speaking, it was his pride. His pride. He liked things the way they were. He liked the status quo. He had no desire to change. He was comfortable with the lifestyle he was living, his own perceived sense of morality, the, his bank account, the many goods and tools and toys that he had, and the esteem and the, and the things that he had that made him popular among people. He liked it the way it was. Dave Ramsey said in the video, he said, you know, it's hard to submit to another person's ideas. And I will say this, it's doubly hard to submit to another person. You see, the guy came up to Jesus, his fundamental problem was he wanted affirmation. I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm keeping the commandments. I'm tithing. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm an okay guy. I just want affirmation. I'm on the road to glory. He wanted affirmation and what Jesus gave him. But what he needed was transformation. He wanted to hear, you're okay, partner. Good job. Keep it up. But what he got was, you need to do a 180, pal. And he couldn't handle it. And specifically, I want to break down this thing of his pride because I think this is really where the rubber hits the road with most people. What was his pride in? Why was he so proud? Well, first of all, his, his pride was in his religion. He wanted rules. You ever been around legalistic people and they like rules? They're just comfortable with rules. Something about rules. They just, and he wanted rules. Check the box. He just wanted to check the boxes. Okay, check. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, I like it that way. I like it that way. I can go at four. I'm out at five. They didn't demand anything else from me for the rest of the week. All right? I can do this. They just wanted, he wants rules. And Jesus called him to a relationship. Jesus said, come, abandon everything else, and come and follow me. You ever run into somebody and you want to talk to them about Jesus and they kind of have this, well, I'm a, and you fill in the blank, and they give the name of their church where they go. I'm a, or the name of their denomination. And you say, I don't care what you are. Do you know Christ? And he had pride in his morality. Oh, did he ever? Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. And you could hear him saying, I've kept all those from the time I was a kid. Tell me something I don't know. He thought he had kept all the commandments. But the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord. Have you ever encountered somebody and you want to talk to them about Christ? And they said, well, I'm better than those church people down there. They really believe that. They don't know what they're talking about, but they really believe that. I'm better than those church people down there. And I want to say, yeah, big deal. <laughs> We're just sinners saved by grace. And he had pride in his money. Whew, this one got him. The Bible says here, his face fell. For he had great wealth. Listen, he was willing to forfeit his eternity for his bank account. Do you know anybody like that? The reason they don't have any involvement in Christianity because they fear it might cost them a dime somewhere along the line and they're going to hold on to it as long as they can. I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearst. Jesus said, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. So let's quit talking about it. Let's talk about you and me. What gets in the way of you following Jesus? Is it money? Is it your pride? Is it fear? Is there a relationship that it might cost you? I think some of you would commit to Christ this day. 
but you're afraid of the crowd or the clock. I want to tell you about the crowd. They're harmless. I know every one of them. They're nice people. Let me tell you about the clock. We got all day. There's nothing else going on important in Fort Myers from now until judgment except pizza with the pastor today. <laughs> Other than that, there's nothing going on. Some of you would commit, but you let other things get in the way. You like things the way they are. You think you're a proud, moral person. You think you're good enough. You think that your religion has got you this far and you'll just kind of hang your hat on that until the day comes. And Jesus doesn't give a flip about your religion or your bank account or your morality. He wants your heart. He wants you. He wants you to humble yourself in front of him and claim him as Lord of your life. See, we make it so hard when it's so easy. So my challenge to you friends today is this. To let go of the things that promise life but can never deliver and grab hold of the one who can deliver. Lindsay.